Over the years, a special sympathy has grown between this land of the free and the beautiful people of that island so close to our shores and so deeply woven into the history of our region. America has rejected the Cuban people's oppressors. They are rejected. Officially today, they are rejected. And to those people, America has become a source of strength and our flag a symbol of hope. I know that is exactly what America is to you and what it represents to you. It represents the same to me. It represents the same to all of us. And that is what it was to a little boy, Luis Aza. You ever hear of Luis? Became very famous, great talent. Just eight years old when Fidel Castro seized power. At the time, Luis's father was the police chief in Santiago de Cuba. You know Santiago, yeah? Oh, they know Santiago. Just days after Fidel took control, his father was one of 71 Cubans executed by firing squad near San Juan Hill at the hands of the Castro regime. Luis buried his grief in his great love of music. He began playing the violin so brilliantly and so beautifully. Soon the regime saw his incredible gift and wanted to use him for propaganda purposes. When he was 12, they organized a national television special and demanded he play a solo for Raul Castro who, by the way, is leaving now. I wonder why. They sent an official to fetch Luis from his home. But Luis refused to go. And a few days later, Castro's soldiers barged into his orchestra practice area, guns blazing. They told him to play for them. Terrified, Luis began to play. And the entire room was stunned by what they heard. Ringing out from the trembling boy's violin was a tune they all recognized. This young Cuban boy was playing the Star Spangled Banner. Luis played the American National Anthem all the way through. And when he finished, the room was dead silent. When we say that America stands as a symbol to the world, a symbol of freedom, and a symbol of hope, that is what Luis meant. And that is what Luis displayed that day. It was a big day. It was a great day. And that is what we will all remain. That was a very important moment, just like this is now for Cuba, a very important moment. America will always stand for liberty. And America will always pray and cheer for the freedom of the Cuban people. The land of the free has the biggest prison population in the history of mankind. And how did that happen? When I was a kid, there were a few hundred thousand people in prison in the United States. Governor Ronald Reagan in California was proudly shutting down prisons. Reagan was responsible for an inmate bill of rights. And yet, in the last 30 years, there's been a total transformation of the American prison system. Today, there are about 2.2 million people behind bars in the United States, more than in communist China. 
I've been going into prisons for the last 20 years. And who have I met behind bars? Well, there are murderers and armed robbers and rapists and child molesters. But the majority of people behind bars are nonviolent offenders. About two-thirds of them are African American or Latino. They're overwhelmingly poor, substance abusers, a large number of mental patients, huge rates of illiteracy. So whereas 30 years ago in the United States we were building low-income housing, today we're building prisons as a form of low-income housing. There's about 200,000 women behind bars, overwhelmingly nonviolent, uh, many of them in prison because their spouses or their boyfriends were drug dealers and they wouldn't rat them out. And there are tens of thousands of people who are in solitary confinement. Uh, some of them are major gang leaders, some of them are people who are violent, and it makes sense to put them in solitary. But the majority aren't, and they're prey to all kinds of health problems, psychological problems, being locked away for weeks, months, years, by themselves in a cell, only allowed out for two hours, maybe, a day. For most of these nonviolent offenders, there are so many other less expensive ways to deal with them in the community. For example, mental patients. We used to have mental patients in mental hospitals, and then we shut down the mental hospitals. So now they're in prison. The largest single facility for mental patients in the United States is the L.A. County Jail. And it is so much more expensive to incarcerate people with mental illness than to treat them in the community. In the United States, we're privatizing our prisons and giving them to corporations to make money off of locking people up. But today I want to focus on one aspect of American life that remains particularly skewed by race and by wealth, a source of inequity that has ripple effects on families and on communities and ultimately on our nation, and that is our criminal justice system. But today I want to focus on one aspect of American life that remains particularly skewed by race and by wealth, a source of inequity that has ripple effects on families and on communities and ultimately on our nation, and that is our criminal justice system. Now, this is not a, this is not a new topic. I know sometimes Folks discover these things like they just happen. There's a long history of inequity in the criminal justice system in America. When I was in the state legislature in Illinois, we worked to make sure that we had videotaping of interrogations because there were some problems there. We set up racial profiling laws to prevent the kind of bias in, in traffic stops that too many people experience. Since my first campaign, I've talked about how in too many cases our criminal justice system ends up being a pipeline from underfunded, inadequate schools to overcrowded jails. What has changed, though, is that in recent years, the eyes of more Americans have been opened to this truth, partly because of cameras, partly because of tragedy, partly because the statistics cannot be ignored. We can't close our eyes anymore. And the good news, 
and this is truly good news, is that good people of all political persuasions are starting to think we need to do something about this. Now, we need to be honest, there are a lot of folks who belong in prison. I, the, if we're going to deal with this problem and the inequities involved, then we also have to speak honestly. There are some folks who need to be in jail. They may have had terrible things happen to them in their lives. We hold out the hope for redemption, but they've done some bad things. Murderers, predators, rapists, gang leaders, drug kingpins. We need some of those folks behind bars. But it is important for us to recognize that violence in our communities is serious, and that historically, in fact, the African-American community oftentimes was under-policed rather than over-policed. Folks were very interested in containing the African-American community so it couldn't leave segregated areas, but within those areas, there wasn't enough police presence. But here's the thing. Over the last few decades, we've also locked up more and more nonviolent drug offenders than ever before for longer than ever before. And that is the real reason our prison population is so high. In far too many cases, the punishment simply does not fit the crime. If you're a low-level drug dealer or you violate your parole, you owe some debt to society. You have to be held accountable and make amends. But you don't owe 20 years. You don't owe a life sentence. That's disproportionate to the price that should be paid. And by the way, the taxpayers are picking up the tab for that price. Every year, we spend $80 billion to keep folks incarcerated. $80 billion. Now, just to put that in perspective, for $80 billion, we could have universal preschool for every three-year-old and four-year-old in America. That's what $80 billion buys. For $80 billion, we could double the salary of every high school teacher in America. Because the statistics on who gets incarcerated show that by a wide margin, it disproportionately impacts communities of color. African Americans and Latinos make up 30 percent of our population. They make up 60 percent of our inmates. About one in every 35 African American men, one in every 88 Latino men, is serving time right now. Among white men, that number is 1 in 214. The bottom line is that in too many places, black boys and black men, Latino boys and Latino men, experience being treated differently under the law.